Well, good morning, Southeastern Seminary and everybody who is here as our guest. My name is Mark Lederbach. I serve as the Dean of Students here. I'm also a professor of Christian Ethics, and it's my privilege to actually ask you to open the Word today, and let's look at the Torah. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to deliver this message for you, and uh, given the fact that we have this remarkable gift that I just don't even know how to begin to say thank you for, um, it's appropriate for us to be in the Old Testament today and for us to start with the very first words of the Bible, of the Torah, and so that's where I want to take us in our time together today. The topic that I want to cover with you is the greatness of God and the goodness of God. And as we open the Word and see that from this text of Scripture, I'm hoping that we can then make some applications to life and to discipleship as we near our, the end of our time together. Now, my purpose in developing this particular verse is to confront what I perceive to be a growing deficit in evangelical theology and ethics that is unfortunately fueled by some of the postmodern philosophies of our day and pressing us into what Dr. Al Mohler talked about last week in our lecture series, into a post-Christian cultural context. In short, I think there's a rising thought among evangelicals that my opinion, my feelings, my story, my experience is a legitimate basis by which to challenge the historically held orthodox doctrines of the faith and to challenge God's perfect and wise moral instruction. To say this another way, I think we are, in fact, I fear we are, making the mistake of substituting, instead of the doctrine of the priesthood of the believer, the much more troublesome and probably heretical idea of the autonomy and the independence of the believer. To say it yet a third way, we are in danger of making the universe revolve around us instead of us worshiping a God worthy enough for us to radically adjust everything in our lives to serve Him on His terms. So to combat this idea, we must regain our theological footing. We must think about our great God and gather some perspective here. And so with this in mind, I want you to consider a few quotes from some important thinkers to help us get off on the right foot. So here's from A.W. Tozer and his magisterial masterpiece, The Knowledge of the Holy. He writes this. He says, a right conception of God is basic not only to systematic theology, but to practical Christian living as well. It is to worship what the foundation is to the temple. And where it is inadequate or out of plumb, the whole structure must sooner or later collapse. Indeed, I believe there is scarcely an error in doctrine or a failure in applying Christian ethics that cannot be traced finally to imperfect or ignoble thoughts about God. C.S. Lewis says it this way, in God, you come up against something which is in every aspect immeasurably superior to yourself. Unless you know God as that, and therefore know yourself as nothing in comparison, you do not know God at all. As long as you're proud, you cannot know God. Listen to John Calvin's words that give us instruction for our time together today. He says, it is, a certain, it is certain that man never achieves a clear knowledge of himself unless he has first looked upon God's face and then descends from contemplating God to scrutinize himself. So with that in mind, then let's think one more time from A.W. Tozer's help. He says this, For this reason, brothers and sisters, the gravest question before the church is always God himself. And the most portentous fact about any man is not what he at any given time may say or do, but what he in his deep heart conceives God to be like. So let me pose a question to you as we get started today about the possibility of us thinking of God in puny ways, in, in petty ways. Which do you think is, is more arrogant? To believe God does not exist or... To believe that he exists, but that he functions like the genie in Aladdin's lamp to answer your prayers and fulfill your wishes. And then, if he does not live up to your expectations, you think it's okay to not believe in him and set aside his holy instruction. Or perhaps to believe he exists, but that you can just disobey him and count on his forgiveness as if sin is no big deal. 
or, or perhaps even worse, to believe he exists, but not be willing to bend your knee and obey, but rather replace his moral instruction with your own because you think it's better. Which is more arrogant? Now, I ask this question today because as an elder of my local church, as a professor of ethics, as a dean of students here, but, but mostly, I want you to hear me genuinely here, mostly as the greatest sinner in this room and a remarkably wicked man, I find that all of us are prone to at least one of these, and probably all of us fall prey to, to each one of them at some point in our life. And so thus, we would do well to heed this advice that John Calvin gave us, that we would look at God and then descend to scrutinize ourselves. So with that in mind, then, will you join me in prayer that the Lord would help us with this very task as we get started? Father, we come and we pray to you as we begin. We want to let Psalm 19.4 guide us in our prayers. Lord, would you let the words of my mouth And then the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. And then as John the Baptist helped us, Lord, may you increase and may we decrease as we engage your word. Amen. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. If you have your Bibles with you, you probably have it memorized. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the original Hebrew does not have the exact same word ordering. And if you don't believe me, you can come up and check it out today and see what I hear in the Torah. But the grammar in both English and Hebrew lead us to some really important points that we can pick up right from the beginning. Because the grammar in both languages are going to use a subject and a verb and a direct object to give us the meaning or to help us get into the very beginning of this, this great text that we have before us today. And what we can see, if you see God created, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If you look for the verb, what you'll discover is the verb is the word created. It's what God does. When you look for the direct object, what you discover is what God creates, and that's the heavens and the earth. And so that leaves us with a really simple but incredibly important part. As you begin reading your Bible, as you engage the Torah, as you see this particular verse, that the subject of the very first words of the Bible is not creation. If you come to Genesis, particularly Genesis 1 and 2, and you think the story is about the creation, you've missed the central part of the text. The story is about God. God is the subject of the very first words of the Bible. And folks, if we get this wrong, we'll get the whole story wrong. Indeed, if we flip the narrative and we put that which is least important in the verse as the center of the story, we'll change everything about this. And what will happen is if you get this wrong, you'll not only read this verse wrong, you'll read the Pentateuch, you'll read the Torah wrong, but then you will also read all of Scripture wrong. And if you read the Bible wrong, you'll miss the point of the Bible, and you'll read your life wrong. You'll miss the point of your life. You see, God is the center of the story. Dear brothers and sisters, it's not us. It's not you. It's not me. It's not, cre- it's not creation. It's not our problems. It's not our hopes. It's not our joys. It's not our happiness. It's not our sorrows. It's not our perceptions. It's not our internal drives related to morality or even sexuality. God. In the beginning, God. So here's our first application of the text for us today. It is imperative, my friends, it is imperative that we understand that we should never seek to find out where God fits into my story. The most basic truth of human life is discovering where I fit into his story. Foolishness tries to fit the infinite God down into a finite purse. It is sheer stupidity to shrink an infinite, timeless creator into the story of a finite, time-bound creation. But I believe it's sheer arrogance to subordinate God's greatness or his goodness to my perspective. So follow with me then if you think through here that Arthur W. Pink helps us with his gleanings in Genesis. He says this, in the beginning, God, this is the foundational truth of all real theology. God is the great originator and initiator. It is an ignoring of this which is the most basic error of all human schemes. False systems of theology and philosophy begin with man and seek to work up to God. But this is a turning of things upside down. 
We must, in all of our thinking, begin with God and work down to man. And so to regain our perspective of ourselves, we must remind ourselves of that which is true and good and beautiful about our God, even if the implications of this means we go against the flow of all of humanity. We must dethrone ourselves. We must. So let's look a little closer at these first words of the Bible. In the beginning, in your English Bible, the first three words, in the Hebrew, the Bereshit, the word means at the very beginning. God is before, he's in existence prior to the start of everything. Psalm 33, verse 6, says it this way. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, their starry host, by the breath of his mouth. Well, what this means for us is note that in order for God to speak these words into existence, God had to be there already in order to breathe them out, to say these words. Thus, the first words of the Bible are for us, in a way, an indictment against an idea that humans are self-sufficient, that humans can just have an unlimited self-expression. No, we exist because someone designed us and someone put us here. We are contingent. God is non-contingent. Now, the text follows after Bereshit, the, 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 in the English you have then, in the beginning, God. And the word for God in the text for us here is, is Elohim, meaning the supreme God, the one true God, not one of the many puny gods that would have been understood in the cultures that are around the Hebrews. No, here what we see based on not only this text, but in Genesis 2, 4, helps us with the interpretation of the word Elohim. This is a specific reference to Jehovah Elohim, or Yahweh, the one true God of Israel. And the God of Israel, then, is the one who created the totality of everything that exists. Listen to the, to the words of John Salehammer in his exposition commentary on Genesis. It's not difficult to detect a polemic against idolatry behind the words of Genesis 1.1. By identifying God as the creator, or a crucial distinction introduces between the God of the patriarchs and the gods of the nations, gods that the biblical authors saw as mere idols. Puny gods, petty gods. The name Elohim speaks to the God of supreme authority, the God of total sovereignty. Listen again to John Salehammer. The narrative states that God creates all that exists. As it stands, the statement is an affirmation that God alone is eternal and that everything else owes its origin and its existence to him. So as we then think through this God Elohim and try to understand a little bit more about him, as we see what the scripture tells us is that if God is in the beginning, if he's before everything else, what Exodus 3.14 will say is, I am who I am is God's name for himself. In other words, God has always existed. And we understand from this that one of the attributes of God is his self-existence. Listen to the words of John 5. Verse 26, he says, For as the Father, Jesus is telling us, as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. Nobody gives life to God. God is life. God is the author of life. God is the self-existent God. And when we talk about the attributes of God, the fancy name for this is God's aseity. God has always had self-existence. But what flows from God's self-existence is also the idea that God is completely self-sufficient. What we mean by this when we say that is that God doesn't need anything. God is totally free and totally independent. And so A.W. Tozier helps us get after this with this next quote. Follow along as I read this. He says, Need is a creature word, and it cannot be spoken of the Creator. God has a voluntary relationship to everything he has made, but he has no necessary relationship to anything outside of himself. His interest in his, in his creation, creatures arise from his sovereign good pleasures, not from any need those creatures can supply to him, nor any completeness they can bring to him who is complete in himself. Indeed, the Scripture teaches us that God both upholds all things that are exist and he holds all those things together in Hebrews 1.3 and Colossians 1.16-17. So we ask the question, if God holds all things together and he upholds all things, how could any of those things give him anything? God is self-existent. God is self-sufficient. Hebrews, or excuse me, Psalm 90 verse 2 tells us he's from everlasting and he is 
to everlasting, meaning that God is not only self-sufficient, He's not only self-existent, but He's eternal. And in His eternality, the Scriptures tell us in Psalm 145.3 that His greatness is unsearchable. He's also infinite. And this great God who is self-existent, self-sufficient, eternal, and infinite is the one who then speaks with an infinite eternal power words not only to teach us, but to bring creation itself into existence. So how did God create? How did he create? Proverbs 3.19 tells us that the Lord, by the wisdom of the Lord, the world was founded. So not only does the universe exist because God's omnipotent and speaks it into power, it exists because God created it as a master craftsman who knits the universe together, fine-tuning every last element of both the physical world and the material world such that its design would lead to maximal life, maximal joy, maximal flourishing, and thereby it would depict God's own glory simply by its existence. Everything, friends, everything that God created is carefully planned. Everything God created is ordered It's designed to work maximally in accord with God's instruction. And so, therefore, it's also good. Why did God create? Well, we know he created out of his wisdom and out of his omnipotence. When we ask why did he create, remember what we just talked about. God is self-sufficient. There's no need in God. There's no reason or anything outside of God that compels him, that makes him create. Again, Tozier's helpful for us. The problem of why God created the universe still troubles man's thinking. But if we cannot know why, we can at least know that he did not bring the worlds into being to meet something unfulfilled in himself. So why did he create? Well, Michael Reeves in his little book, another masterpiece called Delighting in the Trinity, helps us to understand this point. From eternity past, this God who's infinite, eternal, self-existing, self-sufficient, is also the Trinity, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, mutually loving each other from eternity past with complete self-sufficiency. And love always demonstrates. Love always overflows. And it's this beautiful love of the Trinity that they say, we don't have any needs outside of ourselves, but that pours forth into creation. And so what we know from this is the fact that God was not compelled to create. He had no internal need to create means that creation itself is a stunning grace. It is, by definition, the first grace to us. And in God giving this first grace, this means for us that if you are breathing today, if you are thinking, if you are feeling, then you are a recipient of a stunning grace that you did not deserve. To use the categories of Rene Descartes, if you think and therefore you know you exist, then you can give praise to God as the next logical extension of this thought because you didn't put yourself here. God created the context for your existence and everything about you. So no matter your circumstances, no matter how sin entering the world has impacted your experience, the fact is that because an eternal, all-knowing, all-wise God created the context of your existence and he knows your situation personally and intimately, and that knowledge is born and progresses in the loving goodness of God. Think of the implications of this, my friends. God's greatness is actually that which gives rise to his goodness. The fact of God's greatness leads to the fact of God's goodness. In fact, 1 Chronicles 16, 34. Oh God, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His mercies endure forever. Psalm 25, 8. God is upright and good. All of the creation is stunning. If you look out these windows or you walk on campus today and you say that's a stunning creation, then what you should do immediately following those thoughts is how amazing is the creator? 
How stunning is the Creator. God, all-powerful, without beginning and end, all-wise, completely sovereign. He was present before creation. He's the author of creation, His wise planner of creation, the sustainer and provider for the creation. He is the self-existing being who creates not out of compulsion, but out of the overflow of a mutually shared, inexhaustible, infinite love of the Father and the Son and the Spirit, one to another. Truly, as the Scriptures say, every good and gift, every good Gift, perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. This is your God. This is your great God, and in his goodness then gives rise to the way the world is created. So let's take a few moments and think about the goodness of God now that we've looked at the greatness of God and just consider some of the implications of the words that follow Genesis 1-1. See, Genesis 1-1 tells us in the beginning God creates And the word and the phrase there is the heavens and the earth. And in the Hebrew, this is meant to give the implication of everything else that exists. God created it and he put it in place. And then as you follow in the text and you move through Genesis 1 through 28, something beautiful should start to come off the page if God's the center of the story. Because God in his richness begins to lay out this creation in a stunning creativity that's full of diversity full of wonders they abound every day each created thing each flower every blade of grass every particle of sand every molecule of air every cloud every bird every living creature all the stars in the heaven all of them massively glorious in their diversity harmony and wisdom clearly evidence that this remarkable stability and fine-tuning of it all comes from a great god who pours forth into a good creation. And into this, the Lord introduces human beings. It's remarkable when you get to verse 26, when you think about it this way. The Lord said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the, uh, of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And God, then so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God says to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over every living thing that moves on the earth. God makes human beings in his image, the imago Dei. Unique among all the created order, you have people who have the ability to consciously and willfully be in right relationship with God. We are created as God's representatives. And as God's image bearers created in his likeness, God embeds human beings within the creation order. So human beings have this really remarkably beautiful place in the creation order. We are meant to champion God's ideas down to the created order so that the created order would flourish in his name. But God has also embedded us within the creation order so that we would be stewards over it and champion the steward, the, the creation back to God so that as it flourishes, it will maximally glorify the king of the universe. And in the middle of all that, human beings are described in a very particular way. Look at, a little closer at verse 27. What we see here is that humans are given the image of God. So that means if you're human... You're part of one race. There aren't multiple races. The text is exceptionally clear. If you bear the image of God, you are part of the human race, and that's the only race there is. And what this means for us is that we are bound to each other to protect each other, to lift each other up. And all the glorious differences within the genetic markers that God has designed for us to have, this beautiful mosaic of life, this human race is meant to worship the king of the universe together. Now, note from the text something that's really almost, it's stunning when you stop to think about what God doesn't say in verse 27. God does not place boundary markers on things like skin color or weight or height or hair color or eye color. These all fall within the genetic markers of Adam and Eve. This was all a part of God's design for the world. It's as if the Lord is saying, all of those things you should celebrate as part of this great mosaic of diversity that I've created in this world. These are good. And can you imagine if sin had never happened, all these different colors and shapes and sizes, all of these people coming before the Lord and giving him maximal glory in worship services together. Does it come in any surprise to us that that's the exact picture we have of 
the diversity of the kingdom of God in Revelation 5, 9 and 7, 9, when God restores everything. It should be a no-brainer here on this planet that we should seek to celebrate the colors and the cultures and unite them in worship as we go, as we go to the nations to bring back the very thing God created the world to do in his name. But note on verse 27 something very, very particular. The Lord does give something in his great goodness to mark human beings. He says male and female. There's two sexes. And brothers and sisters, arising out of that, there's two genders. It's as if the Lord is saying in the text here, celebrate diversity, maximize the glory of all the things I put in this earth. But don't mess this up. This is so simple and so clear to see. Don't mess this up. Maleness and femaleness, perfectly complementary to each other to assure maximal joy. This is God's design. Maximal flourishing. Finish the task. Men and women equal in value as image bearers. Men and women different in makeup, function, and roles. Men and women whose roles, hear me clearly, are of equal value. Men and women together in marriage to be on mission for God as worship leaders for all the earth to resound with the worship of God such that the knowledge of the glory of the Lord would cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. This is the goodness of God. God is, my friends, color celebratory. He's not color blind. God is binary celebratory because he's good and he's great. God is complementarian celebratory because he's all wise. Marriage celebratory for the purposes and the mission of God. All of these things demonstrate the goodness of God. And if you look at the last few verses of Genesis chapter 1, verses 29 through 31, note how this passage ends. I put it up on the screen so you can see the things underlined and in bold. I have given you every, 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 I have given you everything. So when you finally get to verse 31, it should be so clear to us. If the Lord has given us instruction, it's because it's very, very good. In conclusion, you know, when you come to seminary or college here, one of the things we try to teach you is how to be a good communicator. And one of the key principles of good communication is that any excellent teacher is able to take difficult concepts and communicate them in such a way that folks who are either uneducated or very young can get the idea. So frequently in my classes, my, some of my students are here, I'll, they'll say something really, really important and very kind of fancy theologically, and I'll oftentimes stop them in class and I'll say, that's great, now explain that to a 12-year-old. And then they struggle with it and try to work that out. So in trying to think through these concepts, here's the way I tried to teach these to my kids. Because my kids, as they were growing up, I, I wanted to use a little illustration with them to help them understand, because sometimes they were scared at night in their bed, or sometimes they ran into a bully at school and life got hard. So... I had some drawings, and I actually I drew these out for you on a little piece of paper, and I took a snapshot of them, and you guys have those. Can you put the first one of those up? So this is, I'm a fantastic artist, as you can tell, and what I did is I drove this little stick figure, and I said to my kids, Daniel, Hannah, or Catherine, I said, this is you. The good news is you're not alone in the universe. The bad news is there's somebody else in the universe. Show that next picture, if you will. And so I would draw this next to them. Okay, now again, I'm, I, you can tell my, I'm a Van Gogh at heart, and I, this is, but what I wanted to tell my kids was you live in a world where there's somebody that wants to kill you. There is somebody that's out to get you. And not only does that cause the sin in your own life because you've made choices, but there's also an evil one that wants to destroy you, and he's in the world, and he's causing the world to be after you, so the world, the flesh, and the devil are all real, and you need to pay attention to this. Don't be surprised. But then I would draw this. And I'd ask them, I'd say, do you know what that is, kids? Like I'm asking you, you're like, what is that? I'd say, that's God's little toe. <laughs> Here's what I wanted them to understand. 
the eternally pre-existing God, distinct from the pagan puny gods around them, self-existent, self-sufficient, eternal, infinite, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, sovereign, triune. This God is great. And do you know what happens in the Bible when people confront this God? He had to hide Moses in a rock and cover him with his hand, only show his backside because if if he saw him, he'd kill him. The priests had to have careful instruction before they go into the Holy of Holies because if they didn't go in correctly, they'll be dead. Isaiah, in a vision, sees a holy, holy, holy God, and he's down on the ground in worship. In Revelation, we find that the heavenly creatures themselves fall in worship before this king. Holy whiplash is what happens. And I would say to my kids, this is your God. Because the great thing is that this greatness means he's so good, he's for you. So even after sin falls on us, after the world falls short of the glory of God, the second person of the Trinity comes and dies on the cross for you and me. And through the the wonder of penal substitutionary atonement, he made a way for us to be restored to right relationship with him. Kids, I would say, from creation to cross for eternity future, this is your God. If you've been saved by grace through faith, that God is for you. So let's return now to John Calvin's questions and finish our time together with this, or John Calvin's advice. We've gazed for a few moments at the greatness of God. Let's scrutinize ourselves with these questions I asked in the beginning. What do you think? Is it more arrogant to believe God doesn't exist? You know, whether or not someone believes God exists does not change the fact that he does. And Psalm 14, 1 tells us it's the fool who believes in his heart that there's no God. So clearly there's some arrogance there. But what about the person who believes that God exists, but that he functions like a genie in Aladdin's lamp to answer your prayers, fulfill your wishes, and then if it does not live, if he doesn't live up to your expectations, you just discard him and place him aside and put your Bible on a shelf. Didn't work for me. Then you're saying, God's your butler. You have a gumball machine, God, and you think if you can put a quarter in in the form of a prayer, you can get out what you want. You've got you've got a God who's unworthy. And indeed, there's some arrogance to think God would answer your beck and call. To believe that he exists and you can just disobey him and count on his forgiveness as if sin is no big deal, then you're saying God is a cheap and easy God. That holiness and moral purity don't matter to him. But even worse, to believe God exists, but you're not willing to bend your knee and obey. Rather, you replace his moral instruction with your own because you like it better. This is the disposition of sheer arrogance. And indeed, when you do that, you align yourself with chapter 3 of the Torah and the evil one who's called Satan. What do you conceive God to be like? Do you remember the quote from A.W. Tozier I quoted in the beginning? For this reason, brothers and sisters, the gravest question before the church is always God himself. Always. The most portentous fact about any of us in this room is not that what we might say at any given time or even do, but what deep in my heart I conceive God to be like. In the beginning, God. He created the heavens and the earth. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker, for He is our great God, and He is eternally and infinitely good. Pray with me. Holy Trinity, may you increase and may we decrease. In Jesus' name, amen.